hit go live and then it should connect us Excellent. i'll play a, i'll play a little theme song and do a little welcome you're <laughs> live Let's see if we got this what's up everybody wow 162 that's a good start welcome back ladies and gentlemen to argos anonymous i am argos we have a particularly special guest here today creator and ceo of metazoo games mr michael waddell hello <laughs> thank you for having me oh thank you for being here it's awesome let me see if i can get these tunes kicking it's nice to have a little background stuff here how are you doing mike i'm doing fine you know it's uh it's been a an interesting day interesting week um have some big news that i can't quite reveal yet but you know very exciting uh, collaborations and partnerships that are going to blow people's minds and we just more today. <laughs> Mine's more blown more yeah, because there there's already so much going on all the time. It's, it's been pretty amazing. You don't want to spoil it on this show. <laughs> no, no. If I, if I spoil too much, um, you know, I, I think I already spoiled a, a little bit of it. You know, if you like playing cards and if you like bicycles, then you're going to be happy with the, the next, you know, partnership announcement. So this is the infamous Metaku Metazoo. <laughs> and, <I'll spend. laughs> and then we got was, some um huge news you know I, I won't say any specifics but with tops uh we're going to be doing a lot more in 2022 and it's going to be super premium product um i think people are going to love it i actually have a couple of there was one interesting thing that we noticed recently it had to do with um post malone opening packs of medicine we'll get to it later but it is it is related to tops in one subtle way that, that I want to bring up at some point. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> to keep everyone, keep everyone on the edge of their seat. So um, I would love to talk about the future of MetaZoo because there's so much to look at down the road, but yeah. before we get there, I was really hoping to just dive in a little bit into the past of MetaZoo because um, I know you've been working on this just from other interviews you've done for, for years before this whole COVID thing gave you the time to really settle into it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm kind of a fan of a lot of other genre bending things, which I see MetaZoo as. One of them is um, Harry Potter, for example. And yeah. I love the story about JK Rowling working a normal job and she's writing the story of Harry Potter and she's taking notes on napkins and stuff like that. And she probably has this pile of random napkins with all the scribbles and stuff. And I just wondered if, if MetaZoo Mike has like a pile of napkins somewhere from years of just accumulating the knowledge of the MetaZoo world. So yeah, I call it the red journals. Um, I don't have them with me right now, but it's, it's various journals, uh, various uh, binders. And yeah, we, I even have napkin scribbles as well. Um, and so That's the awesome. idea is- <laughs> It belongs you know, in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of these days, what I want to do is, you know, if once I remove all the, you know, sensitive and juicy stuff, because I talk about, you know, partners and, but yeah. da dating all the way back to 2018, like I have it scribbled in my thing, like tops is a must, um, or, you know, hey, like I need to, to partner with um, someone who can bring this to, uh, a marketing level that I just, I simply can't, right? And, and you know, I didn't have the foresight to say Aoki, but it, it, it certainly was one of those people who uh, were also, you know, on my list. So um, that's, that that's it turns back. out Aoki is so connected. That, that worked out so well. At least I didn't think about it when I first heard about Steve coming in. You know, um, I just thought about the DJ side of it and some of the businesses he's involved in. But then I realized the guy knows... You just see you see pictures of him with everybody every week. It's SS Sniper Wolf, and then it's Logan Paul, and then yep. it's some athletes, and it's it's such a good um, a good link. Oh, we're doing something with Sniper Wolf. Anyways, um, no way, my <laughs> my kids um, are gonna freak out. <laughs> I can't say anything about it though. But yeah, no, I was Stop like, oh, yeah, we have something in the pipeline for that. Um, oh my God, Sniper Wolf. Yeah, no, I mean, that's amazing. You know, when Steve reached out, it was kind of like, okay, interesting. Um, seems like a really nice guy. He does hundreds of collaborations each year. And the only way that that would work is if he's easy to work with, um, he's an equitable partner 
And when you look it up online, he has no one out of the hundreds of collaborations that he does, he has no one talking trash about him. Like there's no drama, there's nothing like that. So, you know, being the, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a businessman. So I was like, oh yeah, like I can work with this guy. Um, it makes sense, you know, a creative like me, but someone that understands business and how to do it properly. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. Man. So coming up here soon, what do we have? We have wilderness coming up and then UFO in the summer. And then seance is the next October set. Do we still have, I heard a rumor that the final set in the Kryptonation block was going to be a set called, and this might be a preliminary title, but called war. Is that still a thing? Yeah. So they're going to be three mini sets, um, kind of interspersed between these, um, One is going to be called, you know, Urban Legends tentative title, where it focuses on Urban Legends as a mini set. Um, One is going to be a chibi set. And this is the first time I think I've announced it. Um, And then there's one that I can't talk about right now, uh, but it's heavily connected with with Aoki. And it's going to be um, a future look at cryptids. And actually in in Q1 2022, um, you're not just going to see that announced but um you know the the plan is to actually make it such that everyone can participate in the pre-ordering of that in a very similar way to what we did with kickstarter um oh interesting so war will be the last main set but then we'll probably finish it off with a mini set uh either chibi or urban legends and then we'll do urban legends and then we'll do uh (laughs) what I call transition sets between blocks and the first one will be set called seven C's or something like that. And it'll be focused on a set that connects uh cryptid nation with Yokai Island and um, has, you know, pirates, it has um, uh, sea and ocean cryptids and, you know, folklore and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that'll be interesting. So yeah, but war is going to be, you know, kind of the last set and it'll coincide uh, with the last few chapters of the illustrated story that's connected to the cryptid nation block. That's why I kind of keyed in on it because, um, you know, I know you can go coast to coast and you can pick up on U S folklore and culture and stuff like that. And it would be, it'd be, um, it's one thing to bring those things into the sets like a seance or a nightfall, but a set like war implies this connection to the original metazoo storyline yeah. because it just that's immediately spoke to me as as some kind there's actually something some culmination of events and this opportunity to bring back you know the the biggest hits from the set in some original metazoo way i'm, I'm super excited about that set just from just well, from the name of it you know having grown up with pokemon uh people like lieutenant surge And, you know, some of the older lore in the Pokemon world referred to this war that happened in the past, right? And so, you know, as a kid, I was enamored with this idea that there was this Pokemon war that, you know, involved Pokemon and, and, you know, nations and maybe even regions against each other. But, you know, it never culminated into anything. And, you know, there's never a backstory that was revealed associated with that. and so I wanted it to do something different where kind of like the gym challenge series, right. Um, they had, you know, trainers and trainers with their associated Pokemon, so on and so forth. And so the way that I view the war set is kind of what if, you know, a war actually did happen. And uh, what if instead of, you know, trainers, you had casters and, um, and, and you had cards that essentially, you know, had cryptids duking it out, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it'll be fun. I like it. And Let's, it'll um, with the story, too, because there, there's going to be a culmination of events in the story. Nice. Let's talk about the demand. So <laughs> <laughs> it's been a race to keep up, right? Because So I was around the Discord last March-ish is when I came in. And it was like a small town coffee shop at the time. Mm. Uh, and, and then it had been growing a lot, I, I assume, from just a few months earlier. But everybody knew everybody. The text, they didn't have to limit messaging, you know. And uh, I remember at the time, 
people saying that the Kickstarter set didn't instantly sell out. And mm-hmm. so, but then, then the demand picked up and I know you guys probably are then planning for Kick, uh, Crypto Nation first edition at the time last, I don't know when you started to set like the print numbers for first edition, but when you decided to multiply based on the fact that initially the Kickstarter didn't just immediately take off when you decided to multiply those print numbers by 10, yeah. were you nervous about such a large increase? Uh, Connected. Yeah, and, and it, and it kind of came with the announcement that I was going to be doing MetaZoo full-time, right? Mm-hmm. And I had, you know, received offers from um, certain big banks and certain big pharmaceutical companies which during the time of COVID, you can imagine uh, they were looking and willing to pay for talents in the data science finance space um, yeah. that were really, really hard to turn down. Um, and, you know, when I was here doing the Kickstarter streams and whatnot, I was like coming off of interviews that I was having with these banks and stuff. Um, and, you know, I got the offers and I decided like, you know, I was going to do this full time. So it wasn't just a financial plunge, right? It was also yeah, a plunge uh, in my life. And it, it, in, you know, the way that the banking world works, it's not like I could just go back um, if like MetaZoo crashes, right? So MetaZoo is the rest of my life. It was kind of like when you read, um, you know, stories about armies that kind of get cold feet, the generals would like burn the ships so that the soldiers would like fully dedicate. Um, I've yeah. burned. No I've retreat, no surrender. Roots. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so well, I we are no, uh, we are grateful for that. <laughs> I have no parachute. I have nothing. Um, other and, and that that motivates me every day, right? That um, if I'm going to make this my life work, my life's work, right? Then I have to put in everything that I have. Um, and you know, so it was it was scary, um, but. You know, and, and honestly, from a finance perspective, like people were like, oh, you're able to, um, one second, my. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Do you guys remember that? Who else was here in the chat? Who else was here last like March or April? Do you guys remember how like quiet it was compared to now? Sorry about that. Um, no, go ahead. So, um, yeah, no, it was, it was, a, uh, you know, people were like, oh, first edition's crazy. Like the boxes are, you know, going for whatever they're going for on the secondary market. Like you must be rolling in it. And it's like, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, but the money doesn't I, go to you. <laughs> I, that I could finance the first edition. Like I could barely finance the Kickstarter, but like my capital contributions to kick the Kickstarter set, um, probably over a hundred K. Right. And so that 18.5 K um, that I, I raised from Kickstarter was just a way of kind of generating hype and, and all that kind of stuff. So you can imagine what multiplying by 10 would do from a cost perspective, right? It'd do so, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So really it was a matter of relying on the, um, the, well, geez, we didn't even have distributors. So <laughs> what ended up happening is the, the, the two distributors that we had golden and channel fireball, um, which I know, you know, uh, channel fireball is contentious and all that, but they actually prepaid for a, a lot of the set and the way that it normally works. And Rudy did as well. The way that it normally works with, um, these sets though, is you actually, um, it's called net 30. So as soon, 30 days after your product hits the warehouses of these distributors, um, that's when they pay, right? That's when they have to pay. So if you're printing something and the printers require upfront payment um, before they start printing and it takes a few months to print, but you only get paid after it's delivered, um, where do you get that money, right? So uh, thankfully our partners were able to to free pay for a lot of that, but but that was scary for a while. I was kind of like, how the hell am I gonna pay for this? I thought it was interesting because you remember um, in July, people were um, unhappy about the $150 that, it, that a first edition box would cost because it was more than a hundred. Um, and the demand oh, was Nightfall. going up. So Nightfall was 139.99. First edition was still a hundred though. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. I meant, uh, sorry. I meant on these, um, some of the retailers were charging a little bit more, you know, and, uh, but demand was going up so fast and then you hit crypto nation release. And it turns out that 10 times multiplier then just gets absorbed so fast. How far in advance I've been wondering. So then you double the print run for nightfall, right? And you're at what point before a set is released, are you required to guesstimate the demand? Because it has to be challenging at times to look in the future and just kind of pick a number. Well, so I'm a data scientist and, or, you know, I I was. um, (laughs) And so, you know, I look at that, but then we're right at the point now where we're reaching a steady state where, you know, Wilderness First Edition is gonna have a print run of 100,000 of each SKU. Okay, that's worldwide. And even if the fan base um, increases by 10 times between now and uh, UFO, right, we're not going to increase the size of first edition print run. What we might do is we might um, have, you know, second edition that comes, third edition, fourth edition until demand is sated. But we, what we don't want to do is because we have so many products that are out there, or coming out, we don't want to overprint in any particular print. Um, we don't want to ruin the collectability of first edition. So it's it's not just about gauging demand. It's also about gauging where you draw the line from like utility of the print run and yeah. and the collectability of it, right? Uh, would it be better for players and just people who are interested in playing if they could get um, – boxes for below msrp and there's like an infinite source of them sure but even the people that were playing you know it's funny is uh the people that were playing at our tournaments you know and they're playing with nightfall cards they were like you know it's really great that there's so many you know nightfall cards available with the non-hollow gold uh slot but you know it's kind of a bummer that it's so easy to get like all the cards that we want and it's like yeah Okay, God, you can't win, right? Um, you can't win. And so even for the players, the players <laughs> are always, they're collectors too. And so it's it would be naive to say, yeah, just make everything super available, and, you know, uh, because that removes the experience, right? Uh, or a lot of it. And, and, and at its fun. core. Yeah. There's this, um, one of the things that once you integrate with an LGS system, and if you're an LGS owner, you understand is that at the end of the day, if the cards in the box are worth less than the box, it's very difficult, or even close to the box price, it's very, very difficult to sell the box. It becomes increasingly yeah. difficult to sell. And what happens then is as an LGS owner who is hosting events, ideally, which then contributes to the player base, right? If you can't sell the box for a profit, you stop, you stop selling the box. And then if you if the game is no longer something that helps you keep the lights on, you don't promote it as much. Yeah, it's not worth it. And then they're not that a new player comes in, they're not going to say, Hey, check out this new game that I can't sell because the cards aren't worth as much. And and sometimes players, I think they would do well to understand if in that broader ecosystem of if you support the value and the collectability, it supports the ability to sell it, and that supports the store, and that supports events where you yeah. can play. You I mean, know? It, it's such a odd balancing act. Um, yeah. Cause you want to support the stores and you want to say like, Hey, yeah, like, Hey, make your bread. But then like, you also want to support the players. And then, you know, if they're being priced out by a store, you know, Oh yeah. Like and it's kind like of like two or three times MSRP. Yeah. And it's also kind of like, you know, I want to support a local game store but like, I don't care about your business bottom line if you're not helping MetaZoo, right? Like, why would I care if you make more money selling at $400 a box if you're not helping the community? Like, totally. I don't care about your business at that point because you're not doing anything for MetaZoo. You're not doing anything for our community. Why wouldn't I just sell those boxes at MSRP or even at a discount MSRP, make more money than the margins that I'm getting by selling to a distributor who then sells to you um, and ensure that you know, players and collectors get the product for cheap. Why wouldn't I do that at that point? Um, So, yeah, I mean, but then, you know, you you say that and, and there are some, you know, local game stores who say, well, you know, 
it, you know, basically like, then you don't care about the local game stores. And it's like, well, you know, rawr, rawr. Like we're not, we're not in this for charity, right? Like we support local game stores because local game stores support the community. Um, sorry, my dog is freaking out one second. No, it's okay. This is the infamous. Oh gosh. Hey chat. What's Mike's dog's name? I know you. Oh, Fiona. This is the infamous uh, Princess Fiona, who who needs to needs to get inside. Hey guys, should I ask about the uh, Cryptonation Second Edition print run? Put it in the chat. It's actually, <laughs> this isn't Fifi. This is my parents. Dog, oh, Fiona. Oh, hey. And yeah, Fifi isn't here right now. Oh. <laughs> That's so yeah, cute. Um, you know, but so the answer to all this is it's complicated yeah. and there's not an answer that satisfies everyone because the community and the, the local game stores and um, the collectors and the players and all these things, they're not a monolith, right? So there's not one sentence that could, you know, capture the complexity of, of the community at this point, right? The, the community is complicated. And, it is. It's okay. a complex thing. I was even thinking about, you know, lately people have been asking, what's the print run of Crypto Nation Second Edition? And I was tempted to ask too, but then I thought, well, shoot, it's more complicated than that because you're also increasing distribution. And there might be like, let's say European distribution doesn't come online until a few months into 2022. I don't know the timeline at all. I'm just guessing. But, you know, then, well, then there might be increased printing, but then it it goes over there, or maybe it's released in waves. I mean, there's so many contributions to what is the print run uh, that doesn't right. necessarily hit the secondary market in the same way. Yeah, and, and you know, um, sorry. Um, we're not gonna have a specific release day for second edition, you know, as local game stores get them, <clears throat> they can distribute them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Pokemon has always done that as well with their, you know, print runs um i will say that in the u.s expect second edition print runs to be similar to first edition print runs uh total right so um you know if wilderness worldwide is 100k then you know second editions third editions so on and so forth in the u.s will be around 100k worldwide it's going to be slightly larger than that I see. Interesting. Oh, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Speaking of distribution, um, I know you guys are where I, so I have customers in that I ship MetaZoo to in France, Italy, Germany, Austria, <laughs> United Kingdom. Um, and uh, they are chomping at the bit, but I know it takes time to develop international distribution channels. Um, any, any official estimate? on uh, like European distribution for these, uh, for these guys. So the dream is Asmodee, right? Yeah. Um, UK and EU, but they basically hit us with an, like a non-compete where they said that they can't take MetaZoo because they have Pokemon. No. Oh yeah. They're missed. They're missing out. Well, I mean, what's phenomenal is that they have exclusivity terms like that, right? That's crazy. Um, and they could yeah. be, you know, that could be just an excuse or whatever, but um, we're looking at smaller distributors um, and if we can help them, you know, rise to the top by supporting MetaZoo, then we're happy to do that. And we have a few, quite a few who are interested, so. Well, it makes sense. That's exactly how it started in the United States, right? People mm -hmm. wouldn't return your phone call and yep. then you launch with the one pe person who did and then suddenly everybody's calling. I mean, how long until... It's hard to say no to, to money if you have a product that sells, you know? Yeah, which is what makes it um, very phenomenal that it was just a, a very hard no. Because uh, what we're, we're, we're offering them kind of like, hey, here's millions of dollars that will sell. Um, and we are laying it out on a red carpet for you. And they're like, uh, well, you know, hey, listen, things are, you know, and so anyways. I won't speak ill of them because it, it honestly was a business decision that we didn't have all the insight into. It just sucks for the UK and EU members that we don't have a solution ready for, you know, Crypto Nation second edition. 
Hey, uh, chat. We're gonna, we're gonna do what we can though. I have a I have a request of the live chat based on this conversation. Here's what I need. I need someone to make a meme of Mike. Is have you guys seen Starship Troopers where Dookie Hauser's got his hand over the bug and <laughs> he like he like closes his eyes and he senses the fear and he goes, It's afraid. Yeah, it's afraid. I want a Pikachu. <laughs> With Mike holding his hand over the Pikachu and then a text caption saying, it's afraid. Or Snorlax. That'd be fun. Or Snorlax. Yeah. <laughs> some kind of something. And, and you can DM me that in, in Discord. I think that'd be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and that I'm makes sense. Saying, yeah. I'm not saying that like Pokemon was like, hey, put a stop to that. It could honestly just be that Asmodee was like, yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to mess with that, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. A lot of businesses, yeah, they don't want to take on this. What they, if they don't know about it, that makes sense. That they makes they sense. certainly must have hundreds of stores contacting them, being like, "Are you carrying MetaZoo? Like, what's going on?" Um, so there must yeah. be something, something going on behind the scenes that, you know, uh, is a bulwark to us making progress in that sector. Yeah, it makes sense. Speaking of progress in the sector, the big news lately is Walmart has said given the green light to MetaZoo, um, and you've spoken about this a little bit, that they'll have, um, that LGSs still get their spell books and their booster boxes, but that Walmart has some kind of sort of specially designed product to sell at Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, uh, and this is early 2022? Yeah. Is it like a small, like a impulse style kind of a, see it yeah, flashy so sparkle, pick it up? It's going to be Impulse Isle. Um, it's going to be Cryptid Nation's second edition. And it will be, it'll come with an exclusive promo and an exclusive box. Um, it doesn't actually increase our Cryptid Nation second edition print run because we're just taking some of the, um, some of the print run and, and, you know, we asked the distributor, hey, could we, put this towards Walmart and they're like, yeah, sure. Uh, so again, you know, good relations with distributors helps. Um, yeah. So, you know, and we're working on something similar with, with Target and GameStop. Um, and, you know, that's just the start. Uh, we're working in Walmart to hopefully get a, a an exclusive blister pack with pin club um, pins in it as well. So, you know, the idea is that we start with a few, with one skew and then we expand to other skews like plushies as well. But we won't be cutting into the booster boxes or the spell books or the theme decks and, you know, the, the current skew, skew uh, you know, products that are part of the local game store offerings. One second, sorry. That's okay. They'll like that. That makes sense. Guys, I was looking up Walmart. And this is worldwide. I don't, I don't know what it is for the United States, but one of the big things about Walmart isn't even selling the product. It's just um, there are like 37 million customers for Walmart per day. This is including online, of course, but you know, you just got people walking past it. Mike, I was just saying um, just the fact that it's there and you just have a constant stream of people walking past it, looking over and potentially seeing the MetaZoo name just seems like it's just a big step congratulations on that yeah and, and you know so it's a matter of foot traffic right um yeah and the impulse aisle is big and i push for that because it means that no matter where you're going to walmart for um you have to check out right the impulse aisles at checkout um but yeah no it's it's you know walmart has something like 4,700 stores nationwide. Um, it's so, huge. You know, Is it going to be in all of them or will it start in like a certain region? I think that it's going to start in a certain region. Makes um, sense. If we were to be in all of them and they were to order hundred products each, that's you know, a, that's that, a lot. Yeah, good that would point. be a lot of product. Uh, and we might work that our way up to that, you know, but that would be a huge, huge, um, I don't even think we have the printing capacity to do that. Can so. you start in the upper Midwest? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm biased. 
<laughs> what about um, would we've talked about tops, and I assume there is more tops coming because yeah, in the top series zero, within thirty minutes or so, a fourteen day sale sold out and essentially crashed the site. But would tops show up at at like Walmart or retailers, or is it just going to be does the future stuff? Is it just through tops? Well, you know, um, they have their own distribution network. I got off the phone a few hours before this with Tops, um, mm-hmm. and you know, I'm not going to say what we decided on, but if I had my way, um, we would have a what they call paper product every set, uh, so every core set, so Wilderness, Nightfall, starting with Nightfall, Wilderness, UFO, Seance. Uh, we would do something similar to what we did with uh, Series Zero, except it would be a, a more of a booster box with, you know, multiple packs in it. Um, oh yeah, cool. And then, you know, theoretically, of course, entirely theoretical, hypothetical, um, we would also have a Chrome product that takes those sets and makes them ultra premium like, you know, accumulates them, makes them ultra premium. And then additionally to that, we would also have like a Sapphire product, theoretically. Oh, makes every sense. Year. Nice. What about, um? I was wondering, so we saw Post Malone, we saw these pictures recently of Post Malone opening a pack of MetaZoo and he pulled a death beam from a Cryptonation first edition booster pack. And if if a person was paying attention to those photos, they were able to recognize a few other people in the photos. And in one of those photos that I saw, which was just a still frame from the video, there was a, <clears throat> a uh, Chicago Bears linebacker, Cassius Marsh, mm. just kind of hanging out. And then I thought, Tops... You know, they do so many things. L- Looney Tunes and Tops used to do these things where you'd have like athletes and tunes. You know, is it just going to be MetaZoo or will there be like Tops collaborations? So, you know, the we have a lot of different athletes, professional athletes across multiple uh, sports who really like MetaZoo. And because people love the zoo, Mike. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> would it make sense to have a set where it's kind of like Space Jam, where you have a bunch of MetaZoo cryptids uh, on cards with their favorite or with, uh, you know, the athletes that have those cryptids as their favorite cryptids? Um, it's certainly feasible, theoretically, hypothetically. Interesting. Cool. That would be a really nice set, though, and it would it would certainly draw in a lot of sports people into the MetaZoo community. That's what I like about it. The sports world is huge. Yeah. So like anytime you can, you know, the, the guys who bought the Mothman NFT, um, from my understanding are, are in large part sports guys. It's mm-hmm. like, uh, you, you look at their Instagram, you look at what they have going on and they're posting a lot of sports cards. And that was very interesting to me because that means there already, there are the eyes, the sports collecting eyes are on MetaZoo, uh, before it has even crossed over into sports. Um, but it certainly it would help. Yeah. And, you know, we're in an interesting place where it's cool, like cards. So you have yeah, a lot of athletes, nice. you know, who love Pokemon, Magic, MetaZoo, and who talk to the sports collectors, right? Especially the big whales in that space. Um, I think, you know, what a lot of people don't know is, you know, sports collectors, there's probably 10 to 20 times more money in, in the sports cards industry than there is in um you know trading cards it's huge it's huge yeah and it's because it's been around for longer so you know the effect that you see with magic having more money in it than pokemon uh does you know generally speaking is because magic fans are generally older than pokemon <clears throat> fans so with sports cards that's you know you add a few more decades right <laughs> um and so, you know, uh, if MetaZoo can can convince some of those sports people that 
uh, we have a compelling brand and story and, and community, then I think that would benefit everyone. We have Avent Horizon in chat is saying that they want MetaZoo to be ecologically conscious. But I've heard that wilderness, there was some some uh, something about the booster packs being biodegradable or something like that. Yeah, so we're, we're working with our printer to make it as ecologically conscious as possible. And we're in contact with um, the you know national forests and parks and seeing about who we can collaborate with and and you know, maybe Metazoo buys up a lot of land and makes it evergreen. Oh, that'd be nice. People would like that. That'd be a feel good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Someone said that sports cards collectors are boomer collectors. I, you'd be surprised, man. They're they're <laughs> kind of like with Pokemon. It's a generational thing. If you have a grandparent who likes sports cards, they've taught um, their you know kid. And that, you know, that kid's now in his or her forties and they have kids and it, it keeps going. When I was at the Chicago national, you know, card thing back in July, August, um, a lot of, it was like from every generation you can imagine was like, they were going crazy about sports cards. Yeah. Makes sense. There's, you also think there's a lot of people who play sports who have large incomes you know, like mm -hmm. if you're a, if you're an athlete and you have a large income and you're choosing a collectible, it may be sports, you know, and so that's, that's gonna, that's gonna lift it up. I'd love to. Um, so I recently ordered the third chapter of, of the MetaZoo illustrated novel. Um, I love to talk a little bit about the original MetaZoo story because I remember last March when I first joined in one of the, uh, one of the things people would say about MetaZoo was, Yes, it's resonant because um, people love the, the sparkle. They love the style. Well, m a lot of people love the artwork. Some people don't. But the people who love it, love it. And mm -hmm. uh, the foiling was great. And it was very resonant for people. And then we know these cryptids. You've got Chup Chupacabra, Mothman, Paul Bunyan, Bay the Blue Ox, these infamous characters. But people critiqued MetaZoo and they said, sure, you have all that. But where's the original story? And since that time, I feel like at that point you said, hold my beer and you started fine tuning it. So I have like, I have these two chapters of the MetaZoo illustrated novel. I'm awaiting the third, but I, I just wondered, you know, um, I think the fourth comes out in a couple of weeks, but mm -hmm. how far you may have notes for way down the road, but you know, how far have you developed this original story idea? The, the original world of MetaZoo. So I have detailed notes uh, for 36 chapters um, <laughs> to, be <finished, laughs> to be finished by um, the time that we leave the cryptid nation, right? Um, and so, you know, I have a, a year, year and a half to get my ass in gear and start <laughs> publishing these things. Did, did you just say 36 chapters just for Cryptid Nation? Just yeah. for this block? Wow. Cool, because, man. You know, the chapters are going to be what drive, you know, those 36 chapters. 36 chapters are going to be what drives the video game, uh, the television series, or the, you know, the, the streaming service episodes. Um, and, you know, eventually movie. And I want it to be you know, kind of like in Pokemon, you have regions. Well, we're going to have blocks and those blocks are going to be specific to an actual region in the world. And, and each region is going to be connected, but self-contained in, in terms of its story and there'll be character crossovers and, you know, but yeah, 36 chapters in Cryptonation alone. That's awesome. I, I like to hear that because I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed the first two chapters very much. I'm very curious to see what happens next. Um, you know, you just mentioned the video game. There's been a lot of people kind of chomping at the bit. In fact, you know, there's all different kinds of collectors and all different kinds of people. I like to say on my channel, um, in my pacifist way, <clears throat> everyone is different, different's okay. And some people that are collectors who do not play card games, who love MetaZoo, right? Which is a category, which is fine. Uh, they have said occasionally, that although they don't play any card games, they would absolutely crush a MetaZoo 
video game that they just the idea of the theme of it they would love it yeah um can you tell us any more about this this game that you're envisioning or is it in development do we have a producer what's the structure anything you can tell us people would love to hear it so it's not nintendo but it's a very very large uh video game maker that has historical staying power that we are rhymes with mega i don't know i'm not i'm not much of a of a poet but um (laughs) you know the if you want to know kind of what the video game is going to be um the storyline is going to be very similar to um the actual storyline but i want it to be semi open world um, and semi, you know, multiplayer. And, and, you know, to the extent that I I have to flesh out in in everyone's minds, you know, I have to build the cryptid nation world first. And I've, I've started doing that, but I need to do it in more earnest. Um, And, you know, I think if you look at a lot of other IPs, like even like Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter started having, uh, movies made out of it uh by the time that they that she had finished like the second book and they're like oh we don't know where the story is going but we trust the author enough to take a stab at creating a series right um and for me it's kind of like at what point do i feel comfortable saying i have a good enough cadence with the writing um to feel as though i can say to netflix or to you know, Sega hypothetically, um, we're good enough story-wise and world-wise to begin, you know, churning out video games in, in a TV series because you guys can trust that I will continue the story and so on and so forth. I think that sweet spot's probably going to be like 12 chapters Yeah. before I can say like, you know, in earnest, like, yeah, you know, Hey, the story's ongoing. You can start now with the TV series. And by the time that you catch up, you know, and they play this game with manga and anime in in Japan dozens of times a year. And sometimes the anime outpaces the, um, the actual manga, and then they have to wait and, and, you know, it happened with, uh, game of Thrones. Right. So, Oh yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I'm sure, you know, J.K. Rowling was like, um, "Oh shit!" <laughs> you know, I gotta, <laughs> yeah. I gotta write these books. Uh, otherwise, you know, the, the, these these poor actors are gonna be forty by the time that that you know, and they're supposed to be teenagers, right? And it's gonna be you know, two thousand and twenty five by the time that um, you know this story that takes place in the mid nineties is supposed to finish. So, anyways. Um, that's a good, yeah. that's a good parallel. Yeah. I'm sure she had to, it took off so fast. I, I'm sure she had to just, once it, once it blew up, she had to really put it in gear. You know, I have this, um, so I feel that yeah. same pressure. It's, it, it is like n- not nearly as much right now, but it's kind of like, Oh, like I probably should take, you know, maybe cancel some meetings every week just so I have dedicated writing time. Um, yeah. And that's a hard decision for me to make because, you know, um, it's just, a, it's a balance. And I, I'm finding that my time is like, I'm working, you know, 18 hours a day on Metazoo. How many on average, I'm sure it varies, but in a given week, about how many meetings are you in right now? Because we're seeing tops, brick bears, plushies, cards, you know, uh, the, the sets themselves, the printers, so so many things what's your week look like what's the lineup first of all i don't think i publicly stated that we were with uh bear bricks but sorry uh, my bad <laughs> my bad um, no, no, no. um you know but theoretically i'm, guessing, I'm pulling this out of yeah nowhere. um i i probably do about 50 meetings a week sorry i thought you just said 50 yeah <laughs> oh Yep. Well, thank you for carving the time out of the Discord. Oh, for sure. I mean, look, yeah. this is, um, 
you know, my meta zoo hours and doing interviews like this are uh, kind of, it makes it more real for me. Otherwise I'm, I'm just like in the thick of it. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's hard, what, you know. What about, um, what about, so meta has got its own kind of game thing going on with a game developer. We may or may not know a prominent game developer from the past uh, that we probably know. Um, what about guest appearances on other popular video games? You know, you see some popular games that collaborate with Predator or, you know, um, any kind of popular icon to bring it in as like a skin or something. Is there a chance we could see MetaZoo? Like I could play a game that I love and play as a as a Mothman or as a Hodag or something? Yes. Are we naming? <laughs> That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> ah! I heard rumors of some pretty big names that maybe we won't bring up in here, but some pretty big names, names my kids love. I do too. That's fun. What about a what about a digital version of the card game? Any plans for that? Uh, so, from a software perspective, what my main focus on right now is finishing the organized play network for stores to use. Um, and I'm talking to some, a, a pretty fantastic team and we're closing a deal this week on it. Um, and then I'm going to turn my focus on, you know, taking what fans are currently doing in tabletop simulator and really just like coming up with their own and coming nice. up with their own that's dedicated that, you know, we can, you know, have dedicated support for and, uh, tabletop simulator is, is great, but it's not ours. Um, and, you know, we can't give it the due diligence and the effort and the focus and the time that it deserves. Um, so, you know, we will do it properly and find our own solution. You know, someone in the chat just asked, how would a fourth wall effect work with software? And um, I remember you mentioned a while ago, and maybe you could elaborate, but when you add weather like known public weather data and GPS data and public landmark data, there's a fair amount of fourth wall that you, you could bring in even in a digital environment. Yeah. So, you know, you could do a couple of formats. One is exactly what you're saying, which would be kind of the most robust one. The other one would be, you know, um, a, an environment that you play in is randomly chosen and then the match starts and you're in a lava environment and, you know, you have 30 oh, minutes yeah. to, to, you know, restructure your deck or something like that. Like, um, or you can choose it outright. Like there are all sorts of different formats that you can do with it. That is just not possible currently with tabletop simulator. So there are some um, deck crafting, like brewing enthusiasts who would love that challenge. That would really show a person who knows the cards and knows the decks and knows the effects would thrive in that environment. I think some people would love that challenge. Well, we're calling it the blitz format and we're going to be doing it in real life as well, where, um, you know, kind of like in chess, there are blitz champions who would in a conventional, in the conventional format wouldn't do as well and vice versa, right? It's a different skill set to build a deck super fast. Um, but maybe you don't capture the same depth that you get with, you know, pro tournaments that have pre-con decks in them that, you know, someone spent months constructing and testing. So it'll be, I think, I think the, you know, when we have the OP system rankings, they're not going to be one-to-one -one in, in all the different formats. Uh, there might be like a few people who are, who are boss at all of them, but um, chances are they won't be one-to-one. -one. There's always that guy. Or gal. Yeah. Or gal. <laughs> speaking, well then, speaking of formats and tournaments and stuff like that, um, rumor was you're planning a rather large prize pool, a rather large scale tournament for some time in 2022. Yeah, I mean, as soon as we roll out um, the OP network, we're calling it the NPN, the MetaZoo Play Network. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. We want at least a month and a half to two months of people playing at their local game store before we have a, you know, our first national championship where, you know, I want the prize pool to be um, something like a hundred thousand dollars. And I want to be able to have uh, 
people who, you know, first prize would be something like 50K, right? That's so, that's so much. That's so awesome. There are some very serious players mm-hmm. who will see that. Yeah. There are there's professional, professional players from other games um, are going to see that. They are going to come. You'll have Absolutely. teams of people that will that's how I'm gonna, that. That's how I'm going to, you know, attract that talent. Um, and as I'm sure you know, being a, uh, a lawyer, right? You're a lawyer, right? I, I am a doctor, which is close. So I have to know lawyers very intimately to not have to see them. <laughs> um, <laughs> you got you to gotta, you gotta have the money available if you want to attract the proper talent, right? You do, yeah. Um, so, you know, for us, it's kind of like, you know, we're doing all these different collaborations and stuff. And every time we do a new product vertical, we are tapping into that new market and bringing new fans. It's like building a bridge from that, you know, the people who collect uh, coins, we're building a bridge into MetaZoo. People who collect jewelry, we're building a bridge into MetaZoo. Um, for the players, obviously building a good game is a huge bridge that you build, but prize money and, and, and tournament circuits and all those things. And that's the, a really big bridge that you can build to, to attract talents into your player base. Oh yeah. It's big. I've seen that in other games too. You know, the moment that the moment that is there heads will turn from these very competitive, very talented players and, and teams. And then when they go, other people will say, Hey, you know, team, that team is going, that team is going, cause they'll talk about it. Um, it's, and it's a, it's a different, it really is a different um, kind of person and a different player, you know, a different, different, a whole different perspective comes from these people. It'll be very interesting to see how that, how that goes. I'm excited to see it. Yeah. You know, but what I want the, you know, I want the convention or sorry, the tournament to also be super fun. <laughs> So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if, if you're a serious player, come to the, you know, MetaZoo tournament. But if you just want to have fun, that's totally cool too. So like side events and like bounties and, and like random yeah, other stuff. Casual play that's encouraged and, you know, prize support all the way down to the level of just participating. Um, you know, cool. There's, there's no reason why it has to be dry and kind of, uh, you know, cubicle esque where you know you're just lined up on tables and anyways yeah yeah well it's metazoo it's metazoo. like yeah fun is is core is that's awesome to hear you know you have damian hardy on your staff and um one of the great things about damian's last card career is that they they did and everyone kind of everyone said this they did organized events very well in that they made them fun mm-hmm. with so many other things so that if you basically if you go and if you scrub out of the of the main tournament on the on the first day you just you have all these other options of things you can do um and i would i would love to see that that would make it a really fun an event that you would want to travel to would be yeah. really cool it may be entertainment that also impacts the the fourth wall you know we'll <laughs> cool what about uh what about a banned and restricted list? Like, how will you guys manage? Do you just look at the once events start going? So, oh, and on that note, you, you mentioned you wanted to give people a few months before you start a big competitive play. I suppose this is also to get Crypto Nation second edition out there and get yeah. cards into the hands of the people first. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, makes sense. We could be kind of tone deaf and, and do a huge competition right now, but then no one would have the ability to actually play in it because cards are scarce. Right. Yeah. Um, and so Crypto Nation second edition is really going to be the first time we're at in mass. We're going to be able to put cards in the hands of players who just want to build decks and have fun. Um, and so, you know, we have to wait for that to distribute and that's going to, you know, distributing Crypto Nation second edition is going to take, a few months it's not going to be like one big you know poof it doesn't need to be either right um yeah so you know it's it's going to be a a staggered release and and we're going to put it where it needs to go and um you know players will develop their ability to build decks you know over time over the next few months so and then once events are going um do you have uh people that are starting to consider in playtesting or in whatever internally 
like a ban and restricted list? Will there eventually be an official thing like that? I know people try to minimize the cards that make it, but you know, it's an inevitability in any card game. Um, have you guys talked about that at all? So, you know, we, our printer is able to churn out a promo in about three weeks. So what we're going to try and do is rather than um, banning cards, maybe we could try a new strategy of print of, of making new cards, introducing them into the player base and seeing if that balances. So rather than a, a, a removal, it's an addition that uh, changes the meta. Yeah, that makes sense. It, 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 that may not be perfect. And we may have to eventually have bands and we might have to eventually do rotation, but the, the goal is not to do those things. Yeah, it makes sense. So rotation will be no rotation for as long as is possible. Yeah. That's nice. People settle into their cards and their collections and stuff. I think people oh, yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and look, you know, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that rotation is lazy, but it removes <laughs> it, it removes <laughs> famous decks that never have an organic, like, res like proper response, right? Like, you know, hey, like this deck is a problem because of these cards and this combo, but rotation is happening and, you know, very quickly. So it's going to be not a problem. And it's like, that's not as fun as, you know, a new set coming out that allows for 15 different answers to that, that deck that was dominating. And, you know, imagine if I banned Quetzal, you know, Quetzalcoatlus, right? Rather than, you know, releasing cards that were a proper response to it. Is it still a powerful deck? Sure. Are there like 10 different decks that can dominate it? Yeah. So yeah. Magus of the bargain fun. agrees with you in chat. Magus says you don't have to ban a card if you print an answer to it. Yeah. Yeah. Power That's creep. So Magnus also says power creep. What about that? <clears throat> um, we're doing what I call like horizontal development. We're adding cryptids. So like if you think about some sets or some car, uh, well, some card games where, you have a set limit of characters or you can only introduce new characters every block. Um, how do you build on those characters in a way that um, is new and interesting? One way is power creep by making them have bigger attacks, bigger, whatever. Fortunately for us, you know, we have thematics um, or thematic differences to our sets uh, that have dozens and dozens of new characters that have different backstories and lores. So we don't actually have to do power creep. We can add variety um, just by having a new cryptid or a new beastie, right? And yeah, and adding a new mechanic in that you know no one no one's seen before that's connected <laughs> to the lore of the you know the character, right? So it's like, you know, we can develop horizontally in that way that I that I don't think a lot of other uh IPs can because we have at our disposal just thousands of characters that already have an accepted community. So hold on one second. I'm going to get my charter. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Guys in the chat, I, I am watching. We are going to talk about NFTs and we will not, not just about the um, non-functional NFTs. We'll talk about sample cards and NFTs. We'll talk about NFTs with redeemable properties or like other functional things. We'll talk about, will there potentially be a video game that incorporates cryptocurrency and NFTs? Absolutely. We're going to talk about draft and other formats. Um, let's see. I have all kinds of notes around here. We talked a little bit already about maintaining collectability. And uh, let's see. Oh, exclusive. Oh my God. The sample card party. Yeah. We have a lot of things we're going to talk about. I do see your comments. What we'll do is we'll finish kind of these big highlights that I have, and then we're going to go through the chat and we'll just pick up a bunch of stuff. So just so you guys know. Back. Awesome. Awesome. Shameless self-promotion. We have a couple of people asking about an Argos promo. You don't have to answer that. Um, so there's uh... a... <laughs> yeah, <Good>. we... <laughs> <laughs> so... That's good. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Power creep is a thing, you know, 
some games handle it better than others for sure. Um, I like the idea of horizontal horizontal creep in the sense you, you can, especially with 10, think about it. You have 10 aura types. It's twice as twice as many different types as magic. If you if you develop a, a dynamic or a pie, for example, you can do <laughs> my wife is holding up the sign. Hang on, Gaia's over here holding up the sign. Ask about, oh come on. Okay, fine, I'll ask. She must be in a live stream. I'm gonna finish my sentence and then I'll let you guys know what my wife wanted to know. It's very critical. So <laughs> you think about it, you have you have 10 different aura types. And if you develop like characteristics and things like that associated with each one, you can get, you know, magic has gone almost 30 years off of five. Yeah. And they do, they do something that I like to think of as a macro oscillation where they will very slowly ramp power and they seem to hit a critical point. And then they, they will pull back for so long you know, and they will go horizontally and then they will kind of go back up. You've got 10 aura types in MetaZoo with, with a good team behind it. Yeah. You guys can I mean, do so much. And in, in the way that if you look at it interaction wise, right. Um, with five points, right. Um, you actually have a certain number of inter pairwise interactions, right. But with 10, it's not just double. It ends up being, uh, significantly more. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite a bit more. So, um, there's yeah. like subtypes to the subtypes. I mean, yeah, that's, well, I mean, you know, think about it like yeah. this, right. So for, if you have two aura types, then you have one type of connection. If you have three, then you have, um, you know, three connections, but when you have four, it, it starts, you know, increasing, right? So in math, it's called a complete graph um, because every point is connected to every other point. And so with that, with, you know, 10, you actually have a, a what's called a, a G10, which is like 10 points all interconnected. And so that the number of edges in that is, is huge. Uh, I forgot what the, the math on that is, but. Um, it's big. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the number of interactions that we can have with the different aura, the number of BCs that we can add that have, you know, differing stories because every cryptid is different. Some of them are very similar, but for the most part, they're different. Um, some of them have hundreds of years of story. Oh, it's amazing sure. how deep some of the lore is already. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I'm not, really worried about uh power creep i'm very cognizant of it though so like when we're you know the way that we're doing the r d is we have ideal numbers uh and ratios and these things that we try and stick with um so it'd be hard to power creep without some of those ideal like deviations from those ideal numbers getting out of whack and we on you know immediately see that in the stats that we have in the spreadsheets that we use to when we're when we're set constructing so oh that's good you have a system for balancing i was going to oh, ask that sure. yeah that's good <laughs> it's very very uh advanced um you yeah know. that's and the data analyst out. coming out yeah yeah <laughs> my wife was asking when are we going to see sai character love interests develop in the storyline she had she wrote a sign for it she needs to know <laughs> um you know if you're if you're if you're clever you might have already seen uh that happen or hinted at and not necessarily with the main characters oh you know does so, it involve frogman <laughs> just kidding well i mean you know wait until you see chapter four read chapter four right <laughs> um, look, you know, the way that I view it is, is we'll never have like, it's not going to be like a vampire high school type thing. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So it, the number of edges in a complete graph is N times N minus one, uh, divided by two. Anyways, um, <laughs> it, you know, it's not going to be like where, you know, some of the, some of the issues that I have with like love interest stories is. 
the people who are interacting with them, their social life and their love life is like the full extent of their personal experience and universe. Um, but most people aren't like that. Um, and so, you know, there are enough extreme things to keep things interesting in the story that are happening. Yeah. I don't have to, I don't have to rely on taking the love interest to hyperbole. That being said, um, you know, uh, love interests are a natural part of human interaction and cryptid interaction. And, you know, so, uh, we'll see some of that in a, in a way that's like, uh, appropriate. Okay, good. She'll like that. I'm sure she just listened to that answer. Honey, I did that for you. That's good. What about um, what about a draft format? Has there been any talk about a draft format? We want to make wilderness draftable. Yeah, because people love the draft. Casual players love draft. Yeah. That would be – how would that – would you oh, – someone else asked too, will every set – and, and you have the whole, you have 20 years plus ahead of you. So this could always change, but will every set have all 10 word types or will you ever have sets that focus on say like just some and not, and not the others? Sorry, I was thinking about something. Could you repeat that question? <laughs> yeah, no problem. Will, will every single set have all 10 aura types or could we ever see a set that kind of focused down on one area of the aura the aura wheel yeah um so you will always have 10 but you're going to have what's called a flagship aura so wilderness based on theme right is going to be forest based uh ufo is going to be cosmic um seance will be spirit and then we're going to have what's called a uh one or two counterbalance auras which um are beefed up a little bit uh, because they are kind of the strength against um, the flagship aura. And then everything else kind of has support for, you know, the flagship or the counter uh, counterbalance auras. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a lot of room for play. Like, like we already talked about when you have so many aura types and so many interactions, you can just, the world is your oyster. Yeah. We talked we talked earlier a little bit about maintaining collectability with um, with 100,000 SKU uh, first editions. Um, what about people have asked about, there's been some teasers about reserve list cards or whatever you end up calling it about cards that won't be reprinted, like um, some of the maybe secret rares or maybe some of the cards in Crypto Nation. Will there ever be, and if so, when might we see it, an official list of cards that won't be reprinted or, or how are you going to handle that? We're going to release kind of reserve lists. Um, once we are hundred percent sure that it's not going to be needed to be like reprinted due to, you know, the meta of the gameplay. Right. Um, right. The horror facts, I'm confident that we can replicate that functionality um, with other cards um, with Things that are kind of like that are mechanically unique at this point. I don't want to say that um, until we, you know, see how the uh, competitive scene plays out more. But yeah, we will have reserve cards that are popular um, that aren't mechanically unique and um, are not like necessarily essential for gameplay. That sounds no. like a nice a nice balance between playing because players don't like reserve list cards because they cost a thousand dollars and and even take twenty years from now there may be some eternal format mm -hmm. where a player can play their their super old their chaos crystal or whatever you know um, and then the players don't like it because they're priced out of it but then collectors love things like reserve list because it gives them predictability and stability which investors and collectors love inherently in, in all markets, not just in cards. They love predictability and stability. Right. So it's, it's nice that you're looking at a, a balance between the two. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's always going to be a balance between those things and uh, quite a few others, but you know, um, I'm confident that 
I'm confident that we're going to make some mistakes. Um, but yeah. I'm also confident that we'll pivot and do everything that we can to make them right. Nice. We've had a, <laughs> I feel like I'm jumping around a little bit, but we've had so many people in chat asking about NFTs. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the original NFTs sat on the market for quite a while. Some of them went <laughs> yeah. instantly, but a lot crazy. of them just kind of, yeah, it's crazy. They just sat for there months. for months until last summer. And then until some shameless YouTuber mentioned them. And then uh, the, the Mothman, the one of one Mothman went fine. But, but now you have these, um, these coin NFTs and you're incorporating functionality, some kind of actual real world functionality with the NFTs. And people have asked a couple questions about that. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how you will, how that will work? Someone buys a coin NFT and then they have uh, some ability to buy. Because here's my thought. If you're not going to increase the print run of the first edition products to keep it limited and collectible, you're probably starting to think about how you will then, how then will you distribute these limited things to the player base and to the fan base? How will you get this limited product to those people? Because as the game grows, the demand is only going to increase. Yeah. And, then, and then I saw you come up with these NFTs that are linked to the ability to buy some of these products. Um, but I'd love to hear how you plan on how does that, how will that work for a person who owns an NFT? So we're working NFT. with Shopify um, to build this utility redemption thing. And they're not, they're not just doing it for us, right? Um, but the idea is, you know, NFTs with utility via smart contracts on the blockchain are a thing of the future. And so what, what how it would work is, you know, um, you would need a coin in order to gain access to a product. Um, and there'd be no ability to like, you know, hot, like hotkey into the, the URL, you know, or bypass mm -hmm. like they do with the apps on Shopify right now. Uh, it would have a limit per person and you'd buy it at MSRP or discount mm -hmm. MSRP and, you know, go on your merry way. It's not a one-time mm -hmm. use. Um, you can use it in perpetuity and we're, we're gonna be doing it for basically every drop. Uh, every drop where, you know, we have 5,000 or more of something, right? Um, and But it's limited. Um, and, you know, the idea is, is you know, way back in the day, we had um, the Patreon that had a very similar functionality. Um, and, you know, we, we did away with that because product was so scarce that it didn't make sense to give people, you know, a... Uh, a pass on getting product before everyone else, but then the bots yeah. came in and and you know ruined that for any everyone anyways. Um, so we see with the print runs increasing the way that they are, you know having five thousand slots available where people can get products guaranteed at MSRP. Bots are going to be eating it up, you know hundreds of, of you know orders at a time. Um, you know it's. Now there are bots that operate through NFTs and all that kind of stuff, but we're doing the best that we can to avoid that. I don't know. It just seems like a natural progression. I think in a world where scalping is automated, um, creating yeah. these walls or gates, um, will put product at MSRP in as many people's hands as, as possible. That's nice. Yeah. I, I confess I am currently um, in the process of transferring money to uh, my MetaMask account, account so that I can purchase one of these coin NFTs. But my, I have to uh, convince my bank that it's me because I don't, I haven't <laughs> been too involved with NFTs or crypto. And so anytime I try to touch them, my bank is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, um, you know, next week or the week after that, we don't have that much time, but we're releasing a, uh, a website that describes kind of the utility function and then a video as well that, you know, talks about, um, you know, what the process for setting up the wall looks like 
know, it gets people kind of um, comfortable with the situation and the process, so on and so forth. That'll be really helpful. There's a lot of people who absolutely want it. They see the utility, especially because you used to have a certain camp of people that used to say, what good is an NFT? What does it do? And of course, you could make the same argument about uh, painting, yeah. right? But um, But now that's gone. Now that you have a functional purpose and a collectible NFT, all of those people are looking at this going, oh, that's what it does. And, and it's, it's, it's good you're putting out a video like that because a lot of those people have just have no idea uh, how to do it. So when did you say in a couple of days we can see that? Yeah, so we're working on the video right now and the website's being built right now. So, that's I mean, cool. it, yeah, it should be relatively soon because it's, it's kind of, both of those are kind of turnkey. Um, the company that we're working with has made dozens of them. So, oh, nice. Yeah, it this just, isn't me like on mint, minting things. This is a, a multi, multi million dollar company. I don't want them unless they were custom minted by Medicine Mike. Yeah, no, <laughs> no we're, we're 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 in the big league now when it comes to the the NFT. Mint, so it, it's being well taken care of. Is it possible we'll see any in the future any other functional? I mean, I know the future is vast and all that stuff, but um, any plans for, sure. for further functional NFTs? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, nice. we're going to be the first major TCG that has NFTs in mass uh, with utility and all these different things. Um, but we're probably not going to be the last by a huge shot. Um, if Wizards of the Coast isn't already planning on doing this, then they certainly um will very soon um but we're probably gonna do like uh, pfps next so think like you know profile pictures um i just have to figure out what a cool utility for them will be they'll be randomly generated like mothman like lasers coming out of their eyes uh, you know but it's also okay for them to be collectible and just be collectible um fun that's fun yeah i mean look I your like car that. your 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 you know Mothman card is is important and valuable and special to you, um, even if you don't play the game because of of what it means to you. It doesn't turn into a car or charge your iPhone, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. The utility is 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 <laughs> the special feeling that it gives to you when you look at it, or knowing that you have it, or getting it graded and seeing it in the slab, and um, you know that's a little bit more of an ambiguous utility and it's unique to each person, but that's what art is. That's what art is. That's what collectibles are. A lot yeah. of them. That's what um, I collect uh, coins. I like yeah. silver coins and, and random other things. And that's all it is. I walk into my office and I have shelves of things I just enjoy and they yeah. don't do, how dare you? They don't do anything. <laughs> they, they must <laughs> do something in order to, to have true value. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, that's where we're at with NFTs. It's the beginning. Um, yeah, the beginning. That's where the world is with NFTs. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. What about, um? is there a limit? Someone asked in chat, is there a limit in this coin drop? Can a person only buy one of these coins or can they just go to town? Oh, yeah, there's going to be a limit for sure. Okay. It's probably good because the demand it's probably going to be high based on the fact that as soon as you advertise them, the discord increased in population by like 50% in a day, I would say yeah. that the demand is reasonably high. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, look, we had, I looked at the stats of, of unique visitors on our form after we closed it down. And, and let's just say that there were many, many, many times more people interested in the whitelist than got on it. So you know, and you use the wireless yeah. kind of as a barometer to see what the, the overall interest is. I saw that. I posted it. I posted the information and the link to my uh, Patreon, and it was only um, open for maybe ten, maybe ten minutes tops. After that, and then it it filled up so fast. And and then after it filled, a, a thousand, a couple of thousand more people. The people were still just piling into the Discord uh, for it. So yeah, demand. And it's high. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, there's, it's kind of like, you know, well, they're not true MetaZoo fans. And it's like, well, MetaZoo has brought many people from different sectors of the collectibles world. 
into it and and they may not collect the same metazoo stuff that you do but they are still looking to collect metazoo so you know well mind, and your metazoo fans <laughs> yeah like your well the like the discord before that announcement had i don't know seven eight nine thousand people now it's got i think over 12 but you're your Instagram has over 18,000 people, like in different social media avenues, there's all these different people. They're following your Instagram because they like MetaZoo, but you know, maybe they didn't, they weren't into discord and now all of a sudden. Or they got them in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about, um, <laughs> that's oh that's man. Gonna some people in chat. Anyways. <laughs> What's that? What's that? It's probably gonna, that comment's probably gonna upset some people in chat, but anyways. Oops. Yeah. Sorry guys. I'm a good person. I promise. <laughs> um the uh mzg cryptocurrency was hinted at mm -hmm. um there are so many different kinds of cryptocurrencies right there's like a finite production bitcoin there is um ethereum which is more functional right but still limited per se and then there's like a dogecoin which has like a um an inflation rate that's much higher you know um when you when you talk about like a like a metazoo crypto, would it be like a like a stable coin that's just functional within the metazoo universe, or like um like a currency coin that's limited and can be minted? Um, do you have any further things you could say about that? So you know the way that I envision it is, imagine if Kickstarter products were on. Um, the marketplace for 99 MetaZoo games coins, right? And that is its price in perpetuity, right? Um, and so if you bought, you know, let's say that you bought those MetaZoo coins when the MetaZoo coins were a dollar a piece, then you'd be buying the um, booster box for $99 worth of MetaZoo cryptid. Uh, MetaZoo crypto coin, right? Um, but, you know, as the price of the coin fluctuates, then either you get a really good deal on the booster box or, you know, the price becomes, it becomes less of a deal, but the product is always still available. And so the way that I view it is um, it's a way of keeping product available on the marketplace um, long after a print run runs out because, you know, as secondary market prices change, so will the value of the coin, but the sticker price of, in terms of the coin price of the booster box will remain static. So, interesting. yeah. And, you know, from a, from a mathematical perspective, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. Um, but it would, the utility will be and always should be an ability to get MetaZoo product um, at affordable prices. I see, which may, now with that linking to the idea that if you're keeping first edition print runs limited, we talked about, so you have the functional NFT coin that could give people access to first edition at MSRP. This might be another way if they buy a bunch of coins like M or crypto, they could then look forward to the next release and maybe be able to access some first edition products using their, their MetaZoo coin? Well, I mean, think about it like this, right? If you buy the MetaZoo coin at $1 coin, you buy 5,000 of them, but um, you know, a booster box, see the issue is, is in order to describe kind of the cascade of what makes this, you know, a good idea is I have to actually talk about the secondary market. I don't want to do that. You can, uh, you can skip it. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> no I know, know it's hard to, yeah. But the idea is by getting the coin early on, uh, you are fixing your cost basis to buy a product that's out of print or older or highly desirable at that, that original sticker price uh, for as long as inventory allows, right? So. Yeah. You know, the idea is it, it, it encourages you to get in on the ground floor um, and it enables like price parity. I don't want to like use, it, it, it allows you to buy product at an affordable price based on what you originally got the coins for. It's like if your dollar, like your physical dollar scaled with the value of the box that's 
you know, remains on the market, the marketplace. It's complicated. I'm not, I don't have everything worked out, but um, I do want to enable better purchasing ability of older products. Like, you know, yeah. kind of like sticking the, the, the Kickstarter uh, packs that were donated um, by staff mm -hmm. into the Democ boxes. Um, it enables you to get a, you know, Kickstarter product where, you know, otherwise you'd be paying hundreds of dollars for a single pack. And it's like, I don't, you know, I like that the, I like what that indicates about people's passion for MetaZoo, but it, it prices a lot of people out. So the ability to, you know, buy another product and kind of get a special treat, I think is really cool. Well, I've noticed you've been doing that with some of the other, um, the ancillary products, how you've been seeding, you know, I assume there's some, some amount of Kickstarter left over in some, some, you know, storage somewhere, but you've been taking it and seeding it into other products. So a person can buy like a random, you know, shirt and then they open up their shirt that they liked, but then, oh my gosh, there's a, there's a Kickstarter pack and it's, that yeah. is nice. You know, that's a that's nice kind of special the, kind of thing. You know, the funny thing where people were like, oh, is Michael, did he print like more boxes or something like that? And it's like your secret yeah. underground printing facility, yeah. Mike. If you think that I would risk uh, what I've built to earn a few hundred or even a few thousand dollars on the side, then like you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> no, I remember last March um, and April and May, you went through this phase where you were like, um, at least this is my interpretation where there were some leftover things like leftover samples. Mm -hmm. And you were like, we need to get rid of these. And you started handing them out at the Collecticon, yeah. you know, cause you're like, if I'm their prices were already up, hundreds of dollars at that point on the secondary market. Yeah. They were going up so fast. And, and instead of saying, I need to hang on to these because they're becoming so valuable. What you, what you did as a, as the MetaZoo owner and curator, right. Is you were like, I got to get rid of these. <laughs> and it worked. I mean, think about, think about it like this, like doing that, you know, if, if you want to be, take the sneaky approach, it's like, how many hundreds of people did that, you know, endear to the brand? And a lot. How many, how many thousands of people did those people go out to and say like, yo, this is dope. Um, check it out. And then, you know, so did I end up making more money as a result of handing out products for free? You know, is that the long con? Um, <laughs> you know, and if yeah, it totally. is, then, then you're also, and then you're also admitting that it's not a pump and dump, right? Because I would have, look, you know, if I wanted, if this were a pump and dump, all I would have needed was nightfall. I could have sold direct to consumer and walked away with millions of dollars, but I sold the distributors at 30% of MSRP. So yeah, that, if that's not indicative of long-term vision and willing to take, you know, take it in the teeth from a pricing perspective now so that the longevity of, of the brand uh, persist for years and years and years. Um, and again, like you haven't been paying attention. Yeah, I know you've done a lot of it and people do see it because you did all the giveaways too. It's mm -hmm. been a constant stream of things and people see it. The majority of people see it. Some people don't, but the majority of people I think, I think do, which is why it's been so successful. Um, some people have been asking about the, uh, the, what, what did you say? The, uh, what are those kinds of NFTs people are asking about that? Not the OG. People are asking about some benefit. Oh, cards associated with the old NFTs. Are there like special promo cards that are coming up soon? I like the idea of doing that. <laughs> and, and we probably will eventually. There's no rush to do that though. Yeah. You got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of like printing 16 cards numbering them for 16 mothman that were part of the genesis nft class or whatever like that yeah. can happen now or it can happen a year from now and uh maybe that's incentive to hold on to them uh maybe it's incentive to go out and seek them um but you know the way that i see those older nfts and the way that i see these coins is they're the first generation of nfts that um are gonna you know be you know the first generation of a product vertical that we're probably going to have for for many years to come. 
is the same with the um there was some kind of loose talk about a uh like sample cards being like a sample card event where you could show up with a sample card and, and someone said maybe it would have to be graded or authenticated or something like that but you'd show up and you could exchange it for an nft one time is that kind of the same thing where there's even if that were to occur there's really no rush well i wouldn't say you could exchange it because i wouldn't want to take cards away from people um but what i would say is like you know maybe the people who have sample cards um have access to like an annual black tie event or something like that um fun. that'd be cool that's fun i would go to that in a heartbeat but that i like the idea so of it being graded i actually hadn't thought about that because this way of like authenticating them yeah it'd be uh, nice uh i was thinking <laughs> that's that would be fun where would you host that where would the black tie sample event be <laughs> vegas i don't know it's, vegas is a cheap destination Evo like inexpe house. inexpensive i mean <laughs> aoki's house yeah sign him up for that one I'm sure. in his ball pit <laughs> yeah <nah. laughs> does he have a ball like an actual ball pit <laughs> yeah yeah i jumped into it it's like uh 20 feet up in the air something like that wow how deep is it can you stand up in it and, yeah, well, I can stand up uh, fully in it. When I jumped out, when I jumped into it for the first time, it actually knocked the uh, lens out of my glasses oh, and no. it, it fell into the <laughs> ball pit. Um, and, you know, this gives you an idea of how busy I've been. This this happened back in June. Good Lord. So, and I haven't got my glasses replaced yet, but. Um, nice. You know, and it took Jesse. Uh, all of five minutes to find it again as Steve and I were freaking out because we were about to uh, film a video and we're like, what are we going to do if you can't see? Cause I'm blind as a bat without my glasses. <laughs> That's fun. I I've heard people talk about that. Like an event like that would be really fun. There's some people that have been some new people that have jumped in and bought some sample cards and there's such a, um, it's such an interesting story. I love the idea of, getting the game out there and at the very beginning people aren't the doors aren't open and that you had to send these out and for all we know there's probably some boxes of sample cards just sitting unopened at oh, some business sure. somewhere well so there are a few things right like i sent out i couldn't get more than 350 people to sign up for the free free sample cards that's right? wild that's and so then, that's so crazy. And then um and then I, you know, I posted on so we sent out that generation and then I think in like October or no, or November I posted on freebies, you know, the subreddit and I was like, "Hey, free sam you know, free sample card." And several thousand people signed up and I literally sat down and I I bought these like custom little envelopes and and put them in um you know one card at a time i did i think like a thousand of those and i just sent them off and i haven't <laughs> seen a single one of those resurface um like on secondary or anything like that like i think people either just threw them away or they might have and, and just were like what what the what that what the hell is this thing uh but no one no one none of the, those people who signed up on freebie subreddit i don't think any of them had any idea that you know it would be valuable to keep that thing sealed. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the magic of it though, because when those things do pop up, um, they're going to be, you know, special. So, and, and you can't go into it thinking that it will be special. And, you know, part of me is like nostalgic that that period is over. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, totally. But Absolutely. I also understand that, you know, we're also what everyone here doesn't realize is we're still at the beginning. <laughs> so, you know, a year from now when we're hopefully a hundred times, and I don't mean that, I don't mean that in any hyperbolic way, like actually a hundred times bigger than we are right now in a year. Um, people are going to look back at the Christmas promo. They're going to look back at the Halloween promos and they're going to be like, they only printed enough of that to fit like the size of the fan base when it was a hundred times smaller, like, so scarcity bakes itself in as the fan base grows. 
and that's why when we don't, we take pre-orders for Halloween or Christmas and we just allow it to run for a few hours and people are like, Oh my gosh, it's going to be you know worthless. And it's like, yeah, tell me that in a year when there are a hundred times more people looking to get this thing. And there was only enough product printed to, to, to satisfy one, one hundredth of that. I want to say for the people watching who weren't here last spring, Mike said this exact same thing when the Kickstarter had one had gone out and everyone was saying, I'm so bummed. I missed the sample cards. And then after that, they said, I'm so bummed. I missed the Kickstarter starter. And yeah. So, you know, Mike went into chat. He said, no guys, you are still early. This is early. And people were like, just, Oh, you're just saying that to make me feel better. And it's like, yeah. no, <laughs> no, this is the way that it's working. You know, yeah. um, you miss Cr- that first, edition, first edition is going to be worthless because you're printing 10 times as much. Oh my Mike, God. He literally said in the discord, you're still early. He didn't go into specifics. He just said, you're early guys. And, yeah. uh, he, and he was right. I just, uh, hearing yep. it again, you know, I mean, so many people have never heard of MetaZoo. I went to Orlando, um, and that was a little while ago when you guys were there, MegaCon, and nobody knew. Hard, well, no, some people came in and sought out MetaZoo, but the, the vast majority of people had no idea what MetaZoo was. And um, it was an interesting phenomenon. If you're deep in it, it's hard to believe it, but it's still like that. A lot of yeah. people have never heard of it. And, I, and I, you know, it's getting to the point where, that's becoming less and less common where I have people who I have had two Uber drivers uh, recognize me (laughs) and I've had, that's when you know you've arrived and I've had more than that. (laughs) I've had more than that. um, Know what MetaZoo is when they ask me like, you know, Hey, like, what do you like, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, Oh, I work for a company called MetaZoo. And they're like, Oh yeah, that's that thing. You know Um, it's kind of, it's kind of creepy. Um, I'm not because I'm an introverted guy. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I like the idea of being able to kind of just hang out and, and enjoy an environment without having that environment wrap around me. And I've seen it with like Steve, yeah, where Steve totally. will walk, no matter where he's walking, the he affects the environment around him. And so he, he's never in an environment that is like, pure in the sense where he's like experiencing that that environment as it should be and that's got to be like and he's, he'll never get away from that um and so yeah. you know, it's it's just one of those things where i'm going to these conventions and and i'm i'm trying to connect with the community and i'm trying to build a community um and and there are certain like gives and takes with that yeah yeah totally you give up a part of your your life you're pro- you have a you're gonna have two different lives. Mm-hmm. You'll have a public life and you'll have a private life, and you'll have a line that you cross when you go from one to the other, and that's part of building this kind of a thing. <laughs> Sorry, so Fizzgig in in chat, he's the the content creator that summarizes my Q and As. He's like ah. the notes I'm taking on the video. Whoo, yeah, it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a huge <laughs> recap video. Um, hey, let's give him some more notes. You um, met with Tops today, this afternoon. Yeah. Did they give any insight as to when there? So many people are waiting. We're chomping at the bit for Series Zero. Did they say when they're going to start uh, shipping that out? I mean, it should be next week or the week after that. I think. I, I don't want to put words in their mouths, but right. I know that should be very soon. I think they were originally estimating like late November or early December. Yeah. Exactly. Cool, consistently. What about um, someone else has been saying a few times? I didn't forget you, man. Um, I, this might be uh, this is probably outside of your control because I know that all products are having distribution issues with like not enough sea captains, not enough pilots, not enough truckers. But um, Australia, any updates on our our Australian friends getting their products? Yeah, we're we're working on sending it to them via air freight now. Oh, that's it's nice. Happening now. Yeah. You guys hear that? Uh, that that can't be cheap. No, it's not. <laughs> no, I mean it's oh. about you know it's about five dollars per pound via air freight. Um, per pound. Per pound. Wow. And so, you know, and I'm competing with 
you know, companies like Apple on, you know, space on these, on these air freighters um, because they're, you know, bringing the watch over, they're getting ready for um, Christmas. Right. So I'm actually in like our forwarders, like in bidding wars, trying to get this product, you know, over. So it's, it's, it's literally the, the craziest thing um, that no one talks about in the industry, because I'm guessing the ability to actually deal with it is probably proprietary. Yeah, it probably is. So especially, you know, yeah. Sorry, go especially on. now. Oh no, I just saying things are crazy now. I, as soon as, as soon as we're going into spring, somebody somewhere says, what do you associate with summer? Swimming pools. And someone else goes, what do you need for a swimming pool? Chlorine. And then within two days, all the news media are talking about how people are going to buy all the chlorine and no one will have it. And then because they do that, everyone buys all the chlorine and then it's gone. And then the price goes up 300%. And then there's shipping issues. It, it's, a, it's such a crazy world now with shortages and worker shortages and distribution and transport. The, navigating it when you're starting something that is exponentially increasing in demand, it's got to be crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, right now what we're dealing with is, is a paper shortage because there are there's a lumber shortage. And so, yeah. you know one in that you know so that cascades into every product that uses paper um and so you know i was talking to my cousin because uh, i was in arkansas last week uh, my family is from arkansas and um he was trying to re-roof his house but he's like the lumber prices are nuts right now yeah they're insane uh, and and like and then i made the connection where it's like yeah because the lumber prices are as expensive as they currently are um, byproducts of lumber, so paper, right? Paper pulp um, are astronomically more expensive as well. It's gone up, I think, 50 to 65 percent in the past few months. Um, and wow. that affects every part of our uh, packaging. It affects the cards, um, adhesive, um, like because adhesive is, is such an important part of making the paper um, because the paper product or because the paper pulp goes up in price and the adhesive is an adjacent product then the adhesive gets more expensive, but the adhesive is used in other types of things. And so those products get more expensive and it's just like this cascade that will probably be studied in like economics institutions for like generations, like another decade. Yeah, it's, it's this is such an interesting time. Stick to your gun says Cardboardia is an awesome LGS that supports their MetaZoo players 100%. Stick to your guns. Where where's your LGS? Where's Cardboardia? I love I love hearing about stores that support the game. Well, he'll show up in a little bit. There's a latency delay. <laughs> That's fun. The um, you know, we've got a bunch of um, the players are building up around here. Uh, I can tell because there's a Facebook group that's regional mm -hmm. and it's starting to like trickle in, you know. Um, it's a challenge for a new game to help people learn the game and having a community at an LGS where you have an MZO or someone, someone who's just taking the time to really learn it, just show up and introduce it is it just makes it so so accessible. Um, so yeah. I love that you've expanded playtesting and that you have you're developing more of those MZO, um, the tests that you take to become an MZO and like the learning materials that you have because every MZO that you make is a person who can teach the game and and get it yeah, out there. You know, and I wish I could take credit for that, but Kevin, Damien, the current MZOs that we have are just like, they're phenomenal. And I'm so excited for, and Ted, of course, who runs our events where these MZOs and, um, you know, and then we have like our brand ambassadors like Devin and, and, and Mario, like it's the seeds are, are planted and, and like the, the, the base structure of how the brand ambassadors, the MZOs, the event coordinators, um, the volunteers, like 
I, I constructed that in such a way that it'll scale. Right, right now we're, we're dealing with maybe three dozen people across all those things. Maybe like four dozen when you include all the play testers, but that'll scale um, once we, you know, the MPN, the MetaZoo Play Network, it'll roll out to hundreds of stores. And so the MetaZoologist program that Kevin uh, and others have built has to scale with that. And I think yeah. our foundation is so strong that it's going to be really, um, I think we're going to, I think we're going to kill it. I think we're, we're going to blow people's minds. I'm excited. I'm excited about it. And then part of that will probably be, um, I've heard some talk about, you know, tournament support, like event kits for stores. Uh, what will that have like, like prizing or some kind of special incentive every oh, now yeah. and then to show up for events? So in the next month, what we're going to start sending out um, retailer kits and in, within the next month. Oh yeah. Oh, that's, that's it's so rolling out with, uh, with second edition. With Basically. second edition, but it, half of them are going to be Nightfall as well. Nightfall first edition. Really? Okay, Deemed. cool. That's cool. As an LGS, then, so you'll, I'm assuming you'll make some announcement that will detail that, and then LGSs will just uh, will just connect with MetaZoo? Yeah. Cool. It'll, and it'll also include things like window cleans and, and yeah, stands and stuff like that. Perfect. That's fun. We're going to like that. Prize support is really fun, especially if it's, um, you know, you can, you can be very creative with it or not. Players love it. They love these little trophies and even a participation thing for people who just love to participate, but then like something that you can kind of fight for. Will you be, oh, will you be tracking? Will there be any kind of tracking system for performance or like accumulating points or anything like that down the road that could be redeemable in some way at larger events. Like, you know how some places have, you play a certain amount, you gain points, you go up in tiers, and then you might be able to redeem them for a buy at like a national championship, something like that. So the company that we're going to go with um, has all that and more, which is why it's taken us a while to set it up. We are going okay. to have everything that is needed in order to have a fully fledged um, international uh, play network where people can see kind of like if you go to chess.com, you can see the rankings. We're going to have a very similar thing. We're going to be using the ELO rating system uh, with some changes that I'm making to the algorithm um, to, you know, accommodate threshold values and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. I want people, because once you reach certain points, I, I want it to make it so that uh, people can make a career uh, with playing MetaZoo. And so uh, we're going to be quite ex expansive with what it means to be an apprentice uh, uh, caster versus a master caster versus a tower caster. Um, it'll start with things like, you know, prizes, but then it'll include things like invitations to uh, special events um, that are invite only and then you know uh, travel compensation and then outright you know compensation for your time for playing you know and, and those will be reserved for the people who rise in the ranks uh, significantly more than others um, That's, it's so gonna... awesome <laughs> the thing yeah. is like um even though by the numbers so like if you look at um there are some TCGs who will remain nameless who, uh, because if you look at the numbers, the percentage of players that are involved in competitive play, like to, the, to that level, it is a small percentage of players. If you look at the overall percent, but you one could make the decision where whereby saying, you know, if because it's a small percent, why support that? But the truth is like, people who love, like I, people who love golf, but are not good at golf, might still watch golf on TV. You know, yeah. people who love poker watch, they oh. watch the World Series of Poker and they love it. Same with football, same with everything. You have this, even if it's a small percentage of people that are those top 1% of players that would get there, you have a huge body of enthusiasts that if you took an event and you promoted it, like you're saying, and you have, you know, and you, you bring in 
announcers and, you know, people that are coming in and annotating and, and talking about it. There are so many people who would love to see it. And so that's a formula that these other TCGs are missing is, is you can attract players, but you probably will cap out at five to 10% max if you're good at, at attracting them. Yeah. What you should really be doing is making the event appealing enough to much more than five to 10% of your entire fan base. You need to make it appealing to 75 and that's going to be easier to task than recruiting new players. Um, and so MetaZoo with the fourth wall effects that everyone likes to joke about not being, you know, viable for competitive play are going to be exactly that. They're going to be the thing that we create spectacles out of that will draw in a, a much wider uh, audience to, to watch the games and watch the competitive events like they do with um, esports. Yeah, there's a lot of potential there with fourth wall. I could play Fresno Nightcrawlers right now. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. No restrictions. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fun. Uh, you know, I thought about that. Uh, it, it is entertaining, depending on how you construct the event and how you how you structure it. That is, that's good to hear, uh, because I think a lot of people would like to tune in for that and even go to those things if you have a lot of other, if you widen the scope to make it, like you said, um, entertaining for a broader audience. That's a great thing to hear. That's cool. If people watch chess and they watch it and hundreds of thousands of people watch chess because of the commentary, because of the, um, you know, the pizzazz that people put into the event and, and the, I don't know, it, it, it esports is a, is another good example, but like chess in its most basic form is highly entertaining to watch because of the ecosystem around the competitive play. Um, you have to make that ecosystem around the competitive play enjoyable and accessible, even if the game itself is not. Uh, but obviously, we want to make the game accessible. So it's, it's, we're going to do the both best of, of many worlds if we can. Yeah. No, I see what you mean, though. Like, even if with, with different formats and different events, it can be broadly accessible. But even if that top 1% of a certain, of a certain category or a certain format is less accessible, um, by making it entertaining and involving, you know, it can still be awesome to watch uh, to, yeah. to a broad variety of people. Kind of That's like cool. a sport like football you know, or, you know, where you have peewee, you have, um, you know, high school, college, and then you have professional. Uh, everyone can start playing football. The chances of you making the, M the NFL are very small, but that doesn't lessen your experience in high school. I'm trying to say <laughs> no i get it okay. and it certainly doesn't it, it certainly doesn't lessen your experience when you turn on the tv on saturday and sunday and you watch no you know, it's cool play. um and so people have to broaden their perspective when it comes to thinking about participation in competitive events um and i don't think that that's been widely i don't want to discredit anyone but i i think that there hasn't been enough effort put into doing exactly what we're talking about. Right. Um, and I think MetaZoo is, is really well positioned to do exactly that. Yeah, absolutely. Plus there's such an enthusiasm, at least preliminarily from what I've seen so far, you have a very involved, enthusiastic community um, who I think would rally. They would rally to that. If you build it, Mike, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. that's what I think. <laughs> um, yeah. They'll, yeah, we'll see. Um, but, you know, <laughs> again, I'm telling you this time next year, uh, barring, you know, any catastrophic world events, although that didn't really stop us in the first place. Um, I think there will be somewhere between 50 to 100 times as many people involved in the MetaZoo community. So for those of you who feel left out um, or as though you've missed the train, you are still early. Trust me. And I think that that is an important thing to remember uh, when engaging in the community. You are part of, of a select few who got in and, and are, you know, a passionate, you know, uh, original base for, for the game, the community. And I, you know, so thank you um, for being a part of that. 
and, and, and I have to call it relatively soon in the next five minutes or so because ah. uh, I have a, a pounding headache uh, from being on the computer all day. But um, that's fair. You've carved out we, a lot of time for us. We all we all very much appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you know, we should do this. We should do this um, every few months. We should touch base. I would love that. Yeah, that would be great. We'll just um, let's see what else. We've seen a couple people say some things in chat. Yeah, let's do like one more question and then and then we can hop off. How about MetaZoo Fortnite? MetaZoo Roblox? MetaZoo? Can I get a nod? Can I get a subtle smile? Any indication of? Oh, got to go. Um, <laughs> that was the doorbell. <laughs> that was a bad one. Here's what we'll do. Chat, you have one chance. MetaZoo Mike has given us almost two hours of his time, for which we are very grateful. Um, let's all give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much. You're very busy, 50 meetings a week, and he's here for us doing this. In addition to his MetaZoo Hour in Discord today. So um, if you have a last critical question, put it in all caps, pound it into chat. Um, if it's about events, you know, they post their events in the Discord. Um, that is your Christmas promo. I see that coming up. Oh, there we go. That's coming up a lot. Look at that. Times we three, four, are five. getting it. Um, the idea is to put it into everyone's house by December 13th. Oh, that's early. Well, oh, that's got great. Their presents. <laughs> yeah, they do. Do you hear that, guys? You can wrap your presents. Ideally, that's the plan. Wrap your presents. With two weeks to spare or ten days, that's cool. Thanks, thanks, Mike. This was yeah, a good course. time. Um, let's do it again. I'm, I'm just trying to see if there's one more question that I can answer. How will we redeem coins? We are looking at creating flagship physical retail stores uh, where you can redeem your coins for special prizes. That's fun. Where would the first one be? Do you know? Uh, looking into that, looking into that. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Oh, guys. Well, um, right now, like California or Vegas, California or Vegas, um, someplace in California and Vegas and Nevada, uh, are kind of the likely places or New York city. So we'll see. Nice. One, yeah. one coast, the other, or the highly accessible Las yeah. Vegas. That's fun. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, look, thank you so much. It's been uh, an amazing interview. And I'm going to go watch Pay Money Wubby right now. So nice. Uh, everyone enjoy their, their evening. And uh, let's do this again sometime soon. Sounds good, Mike. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody, yeah. for coming by. This was awesome. Appreciate the support. As always, MetaFam, have a good night.